Hi, everybody, and welcome to a new FBA webinar. Uh, my name is Christian Dobrev. I'm Chief Partnerships Officer at the Football Business Academy. And together with us today, we have one of our recent partners, uh, Socios.com. Their CEO, Alexandra Dreyfus, is with us today. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hi, Chris. Good. Thank you very much for the invitation. Glad to have you here. So today, we're going to talk, obviously, a little bit about uh, Socios.com in Chile, uh, what you guys do exactly, the whole a space about cryptocurrency, blockchain, uh, NFTs, all these you know buzzwords that are uh, around the world uh, in this day and age. Uh, maybe why don't you start with sharing a little bit on your personal background in terms of how your professional journey has been uh, before launching Socios.com? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I hope I'm gonna try to share the journey uh, of uh, Socios.com and what we are doing, and that you will find it interesting. And especially, you will download the Socios.com app, and maybe you become a client and uh, as a fan of PSG, Juventus, or something. Well, beside a joke, um, of course, uh, with this accent, I'm French. Uh, I've been working in the internet space for 25 years, 26 now, uh, since 1995. We created different internet companies, uh, mainly in, actually historically started in France in 1995 with a, something that we call a web agency, sold it to Publicis Group in 98, uh, 90, yeah, 98, then created another baby called webcity.com, which was an online city guide uh, with like the best restaurants and the best uh, movie theaters and all that stuff. Uh, raised money, went up, went down, went bankrupt, failed, uh, got it back and sold it very, very very interesting journey learned a lot lost a lot um but i was young i was 21 uh, at that time i had more than uh, like 90 employees even though i was only 22 so it was a very cool experience it was for, for those who remember which is probably not your audience <laughs> but uh, it, it's it was the, the the beginning of the internet in the in the, in the 1999 and uh, 2000 so it was a good years then in 2004 i moved in the online gambling space with my first venture called Winamax, um, which was a sports betting company at first and then became poker. Um, the idea in 2004 was that we were envisioning, we were three partners, uh, we were envisioning the um, regulation to come in Europe and especially to come to France. Um, and it came very, very late, it came six years later. Uh, so we were slightly early, but um, me, I actually sold my shares in 2006 for plenty of reason, and I moved to Malta, where I live now for 15 years. Uh, and I created another gaming company called Chili Poker, uh, which will explain later the chilies that we have today. Uh, and it's it was Chili Poker, Chili Bet, Chili uh, Gaming, and all the stuff uh, around the chili as a, as a chili pepper. Um, did that for six, seven, eight years, something like this, and actually sold the technology. So we, we, we create a, our own platform, not the, the poker platform, not the betting, but all the backend payment, fraud, bonuses, CRM, and everything that makes the business running and regulation. We sold it to a US company, a listed company called Scientific Games. Um, and I spent two years, 2012, 2014, more or less, uh, between uh, Europe and, uh, and US, uh, educating uh, US uh, even sometimes senators and regulators about gambling, which now became a big thing, but at that time was still very, very much seen as like, ooh, gambling is bad. Um, so what I've learned is that everything is bad up t uh, till someone take a cut out of it. So uh, that's what happened in, uh, in, in, in gaming. I will always remember, you know, the NBA, NFL, NHL, everybody was saying, ooh, gambling is bad. It's gonna change the integrity of the game. We should not promote that. And then it ended up like, oh, wait a second, we can get a percentage out of it? Nah, that's good. Let's do it. Uh, so it is what it is. It, I guess that was my, my, uh, one of my big lessons in sports. A lot of the sports industry is all about money, uh, which is good, but it's bad as well. So you have to find the right balance. Okay. And I, I stayed a little bit into poker from 2000, um, 2013, Till uh, now, I actually still own something called uh, the Global Poker Index, GPI, and uh, handonmob.com, which, which is and are still the kind of official ranking authority for poker players. So wherever you, you play a poker tournaments in uh, anywhere in the world, uh, not online, live, uh, you will be ranked 
And we as a company, or my company rather, because I'm not involved anymore, but uh, they, they give you a ranking, like, a, like ATP will give you a ranking uh, in, a, in, a, in tennis. Uh, and uh, that's what we do. And because of that, because I bought that in 2013, because of that, we did something that was called the Global Poker League in 2015 or 16, and raised a bit of money, did these things, created a league from scratch, literally a league. Uh, there was a commissioner, uh, there, was, uh, there was 12 teams, 12 franchises, the Paris Sofiators, the New York Rounders, the uh, Las Vegas Moneymakers, so 12 teams from all over the world. And we created one league from scratch where we own everything. So as a business, it was very interesting because you own the league, you own the teams, you pay the players. So you own all the IP and all the rights of everything. So the goal was to try to sportify poker. Did that for one year, failed, uh, failed. There was an audience, but not a big audience. Um, poker at that time was still and still, I mean, it's super mainstream, but difficult to, to engage, to promote in many ways and I ended up owning a sport that doesn't worth anything but still own a sport and the question was how can you engage and monetize your fan base cool I own a league I own teams but how can I engage and monetize my fan base and that's how actually Socios uh, came up it's by our own failure in engaging and monetizing our limited audience that we started to think and brainstorm hey what, how can we do that for our own fans? We had like a few hundreds of thousands, maybe a couple of millions of people at some point who watch the whole content, but we, we, we generated zero out of it. So the, it was really like, hey, what can I do with them? And the more we thought about it, the more we realized that the best way to, have, to engage and monetize fans would be to have, for, for them to have like a, a vested interest in the team, for them to have a say, for them to, to, to be part of it. And because we own the franchise, well, that's not an issue. But because we are doing poker, uh, it's not really scalable. So we started to pivot into esports. Then we realized that esports is great, but it's too much controlled by um, publishers. So you cannot do anything more or less except without the approval of a publisher. So we pivoted pretty fast into, um, instead of trying to do that for ourselves, let's try to do that for the others. And these guys have thousands, hundreds of millions of fans. So let's build out of this. And that's how the idea came up in 2017. And officially we really start and, 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 and starting to build early 18. So early 18, we raised uh, a lot of money through like a private placement uh, in, in crypto, especially in Asia, Japan, Korea, and, and uh, well, everywhere, but um, mainly Asia. Um, and we raised money and we started to, to develop what we were doing. And fast forward, just for the sake of it, uh, we are now 100 plus uh, employees full time. We work with 25 IPs, including, uh, let me see, there is some, uh, what is this one? Yeah, uh, Paris Saint Germain, Barcelona, AC, um, Atletico, AC Milan, etc., UFC, and others. Uh, and our job, and the way we call it, is to tokenize sports teams. And the way we do that uh, is we are creating, and I take that as an example, we are creating a token. Well, that's a coin, it's stupid, but it's just for at least to symbolize what we are doing. Uh, this is a fan token, or the representation of a fan token, rather. And the fan to what is a fan token? I own this, uh, it's a digital asset, it's in my mobile phone. Uh, and by owning this, it gives me two things. One, it gives me a recognition that you as a team, as a franchise, as a football club, as a whatever sports organization, you are giving me a recognition, almost a social status, that I'm an official fan, I'm a super fan, I'm a fan 2.0. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not anymore like a, a, an anonymous follower on Twitter. And because I'm recognized at this new digital age or new, uh, new age fan, I have a voice. And instead of owning a share of a company, I own a share of influence. By owning a share of influence, I can decide what the club is asking me. The club is going to ask me, hey, what music do you want to have in the stadium? What jersey do you want to have? What is the design of the bus? Whatever the club wants to ask their fans, now they're going to ask the people who have fan tokens. And that's more or less what we're doing. Great. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction, Alex. And so maybe um, also for those that are still wondering, like what exactly is the difference then between Socios and Chilis? Yes. So, Socios. So, well, first, the history of why, and then what is it today? 
uh, originally, whatever we were going to develop was going to be called Chili's. Chili's is our currency. Chili's is our, our digital asset, rather, but our token. Um, Chili's is the real blockchain that we have. Uh, so there is a blockchain where the fan tokens are minted. No, I lost you. But it means that it's where these tokens are created on the blockchain. They are created on the, on the Chili's chain. Uh, and originally, the consumer product was supposed to be called Chili's because it was a bit more modern than anything else. And because we were originally more esports oriented. But the more we moved into the traditional sports and especially soccer slash football, the more we decided to use another name that we managed to acquire, socios.com. Um, and now the, 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 the difference between both is Socios is the consumer facing product. It's the, the app that you download. It's the app that has 400,000 uh, monthly active users right now. Uh, it's the app where everything we are doing for the users is. And Chili's is the currency and the blockchain platform uh, that is behind Socios and that power uh, the platform. Okay, great. And just for those that uh, maybe are not too familiar with you know blockchains and cryptocurrencies, like I guess, most of them will maybe have heard of Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum, and maybe the term altcoin. Like, how does that exactly <laughs> relate to this? It's a bit like the internet, you know, uh, especially for being lucky to, to be there since 1995. Uh, internet it was a buzzword. Uh, and then there is plenty of categories into that, uh, that stuff. Um, here, it's a little bit the same. Bitcoin is a store of value, for sure. Uh, and... May maybe it was designed to be a currency, but it's not a currency. It's a store of value. It's the gold of, um, it's the digital gold period. Uh, then Ethereum would be more, we call that the internet money, uh, or rather it's the technology that made programmatic money. And Ethereum is the platform and the, and the fuel and the gas, it's called gas actually, that run on that platform. Altcoins are the alternative coins because Originally, everything that is a crypto related is a coin. I don't like the, I actually don't like the word coin at all. I rather like tokens. And I, most importantly, I believe that what we do is digital assets. It's not cryptocurrencies at all. At all. Um, and the, the, the Chili's or the fan tokens or rather crypto assets and tokens in general, we don't compete obviously with Bitcoin or Ethereum whatsoever. We are just a product that has a niche in the sports and entertainment space. Uh, and we try to use the technology to create something that didn't exist before. I'm a strong believer that when a new tech comes, it's, I mean, first of all, the, only the Im imagination uh, is the limit or there, you know, there, is no, uh, there is no limit in what you can create. But the question is, it's not about creating a new, crypt uh, a new currency that's gonna replace the dollars or creating a new cryptocurrency that's gonna replace how you pay your sandwiches in the stadium. This is useless. Nobody give a, give a F about that. What matters is how do you use technology to create something that does not exist, add value, create a new revenue stream, and that's what we are doing and that's what we are pushing. All right, great. With that uh, introduction about the crypto space and, and about the company set, um, let's move it on to the football industry a bit. Um, obviously, you and I, we've been working in the football industry as well, and the, and the viewers that have done so as well, they know that typically football clubs are the ones that are, a, let's say, a bit more risk averse, like they're typically not the first ones to adopt a new technology. Um, usually it comes from other industries and then you know, football uh, adopts it. What can you tell us about those initial conversations that you had back in the day um, with first for football clubs? Maybe tell us a bit about who was the first football club and, and how did they uh, take that step? Our first two clubs were actually PSG and Juventus. PSG was the first one, and really not because it was French, it's just because they connected the first and, and, and we, we understood the kind of each other um, better than other clubs, but PSG and Juventus was the first one. Um, listen, there is, clubs are risk averse. Clubs are reluctant to innovate. They are afraid of innovation. Um, th three years ago, there was, we were in the uh, early mid 18. There was still, it was before, let's say, a significant crash of the crypto sphere. So there was still a lot of money involved. And 
of course, at the end, the, the business of a club is to generate revenue to pay the players. <laughs> That's it. That's the business of a, of a club. Uh, and to, to win, of course, um, trophies. But for that, they need to pay players and for that, they need to make money. Um, so everything is about money, which is good and bad. It's good because, I mean, first it's bad, let's say, because if you don't have money, there is no way, even if you have the best idea ever, that you can usually engage with the club. And it's good because if you have money, you can at least open doors. Uh, and we were very lucky to raise funds early 18 that give us this opportunity to be listened. And that's the key here. It's not necessary that you have money that you can score a deal. This I can tell you. We have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of cash and yet we cannot sign everything we want. But we can be listened. And that was true three years ago. Today it's different because now uh, three years ago we were, uh, we were a PowerPoint in, in a way. We were, I mean, sure, I had the track record. I can explain what we were going to do because I had experience, um, and, but the, the product was not there. Uh, now, three years later, we have thousands of millions of dollars of revenue, probably close to 100 million already, and we generated revenue for the clubs. So every club, I can give you some interesting things, but the teams we are talking to in US right now, they are all calling uh, the European clubs. And of course, because the European clubs that we work with or pretty happy of uh, what we have, uh, that uh, it gives us an edge to be successful more or less everywhere in the world. If my wife can stop calling me at the same time, that would be amazing. Uh, let me just remove the notification here, sorry. Up. And um, so the, the clubs, it's all about education. You need to, you need to, 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 to break this barrier. Uh, and actually my call just before was with the president of a club a club that I'm working with more than two years and yet I never spoke to the president. Um, and all of this is changing because now we become legit. Uh, at the end, you know, originally, yeah, there, were, there is still like a sponsoring part of our deals. Of course, there is money involved. There is minimum guarantee, etc. That's how you, you kick off some of, the, especially the big clubs, smaller clubs, we don't have this. Um, but now that we are generating revenue, it's, it's easier for us to engage. And that's great because now we can, we, we are really seen as a partner and as I, I, I like to call it a revenue enabler, uh, we, we, we are creating new revenue. Um, and that's great. And, and at the end, one of the new things I, I usually say to, um, to the clubs we are working with is, listen, our job is to try to make your passive funds into active funds. And we try to engage and monetize these funds. And our job, it's not to target the 50,000 people you have in the stadium, even the people that are in the city, and sometimes not even the people that are in the country of the teams. Our job is to try to engage with global fan base, even for a smaller team. And there are fans everywhere in the world that have an affinity towards these uh, teams, but what can you offer them? Uh, even if they, back a, uh, they buy a fake jersey in Japan or in Vietnam, they are still a fan. Uh, and what can you offer them? So that's what we're trying to build. All right, and, and so you mentioned about um, the bigger clubs versus the smaller clubs. Like, what would be the, the key differences in, in the way they use the, the platform? We, we, we are at the we are super early stage in the way the platform is used. First, because our platform has 10% of the uh, features I'd, I'd like it to have. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's very frustrating, of course, as an entrepreneur and also I'm a product and tech guy. So I'm even more frustrated. Um, so of course, you could argue that the smaller clubs, Apollon, Apollon in Cyprus, very small clubs, good guys. Uh, they did something very cool last some uh, last I don't know when. Um, let's say last summer, they, there was an exhibition match uh, derby between two teams in the in the country in the, in, um, in Limassol, and you as a fan who owns the token of that team, you were able to decide what will be the starting eleven, let's say, of the team, and the, and the four three three and all that stuff. Of course, that works only on an exhi ex exhibition match to the point that we receive actually a FIFA letter asking us, hey guys, you cannot do that for, for normal matches. Okay, boss, got it. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, um, you could argue that smaller clubs are obviously more creative and that's what we hope. But on the other end, the bigger clubs uh, and big, 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 well, yeah, bigger clubs are more powerful. So we, we need to find the right balance. Bigger clubs are of course more painful and I will tell you exactly the words I use when I talk to the clubs is my job is to put you out of your comfort zone. That's my job. And they hate me for that. And that's okay because we, we need, the, the only way to disrupt an industry is to push limits. 
Uh, and for us, or we, we try to push some limits. It's not always welcome. And sometimes, of course, we go a little bit too far, but that's okay um, because uh, we, we are not corporatist. Um, so it's interesting. Um, now we, we, we do have an healthy relationship with clubs, obviously. Um, and, and, and we learn every day. And, and, but we are still two, three years before clubs and ourselves have a great product and that is fully understood and embraced globally. Okay. And so uh, speaking, speaking of those, those fans, so you said, you know, most teams, they have obviously a limited amount of fans within, let's say, the city or, or the country. And especially for the bigger clubs, the majority of the, the numbers are outside. Um, well, what, what do you know about those demographics in terms of what type of, let's say, Barca fan or Juve fan are using uh, socios? And like, does it happen a lot where even people that support other teams still decide to buy their tokens for some reason? So, the first question is, what is a fan? In 2021, a fan, at least for us, there is a, there, if you Google, there is a definition of the fluid fan. Uh, and, and, and I like it. And, but for us, and for me, a fan is a sum of different tribes. Someone that is in a stadium who has a tattoo is not the same fan that someone who is in Japan and, and support the team. And I am a strong believer that there is not anymore except for the hardcore fans, but that's not our target. But there is not anymore one fan, one team, or one fan, one sport. So right now you like Barca because of Messi, you like Juve because of Ronaldo, you like PSG because of Neymar or Mbappé. Uh, and we, we've seen that uh, 52% of our users buy more than two teams, uh, 38 buy more than three teams. It doesn't mean that it's good or bad. It's just the reality of demographics on how <coughs> sorry, fans are engaging with, um, with clubs. And you could probably do, that's interesting actually, I never thought about that. You could probably work with Twitter. You need to find that, uh, Chris. We need to ask Twitter, what is the average, how many users that use that um, follow one team, follow uh, other teams? That would be interesting. Uh, and there, there is this stat that we say, uh, it's dug out, we did that a few years ago, that uh, a football fan is a fan of 4.16 in average. Is it true or not? Uh, we don't know, but there was a survey out of this. So now, um, we, yes, we believe that fans will be multi-teams and that's why we try to onboard as many teams as we can because the more team we onboard, the more each team generate revenue. We, we are, at the end, we are like a marketplace. We are, there, there is a significant, what we call network effect. The same on Amazon, the same on Facebook, the same on eBay. The more you have Facebook page of clubs, the more each clubs can actually have uh, users and fans. If I was to launch my own Facebook page on not Facebook, would be called a website. Well, it's like having a shop in a dead end, uh, in a dead, dead, dead end street without light. So the, the fact that you're part of an ecosystem add more and more opportunity to generate revenue and exposure and engage. Um, but yes, the, to, to back to your question, uh, a Japanese fan of PSG will probably act different than a Parisian fan of PSG. And that's fine. They are different fans. Uh, but they are still fans. We should, uh, I'm very tough when I say that, but we should not discriminate someone that is fan of a team based on the fact that he was not born or live in the city of the team that is supporting. Okay. And, and the way things are going, do you think clubs will eventually have the opportunity to reach 100% of their audience? <laughs> I like that question. Uh, no. Uh, so, I do not, I mean, uh, I, I don't believe, it's not that I don't believe, it's factual anyway, but clubs can't reach 100% of their audience. It's impossible. Uh, because the way a club was going to talk to their uh, email list, Twitter feed, etc., is one way. But there is many fans that will never follow uh, the Twitter feed. They, they will just bet on bet on uh, bet365 or bwin or whatever they're going to follow on marca.com or livescore.com or whatever so they are very fragmented um and yet they are fan of the team they, they, they're going to read the news they're going to check the live score sometimes they're going to bet they're going to they're going to engage they, they, there is an affinity with the with the brand so because they cannot reach 100 of their audience and and i will say me as a sponsor i know it because uh, of course we, we we know that when we push a messaging through the team, we don't reach 100% of the people they, they claim they can. Um, so 
uh, at the end, the key, I guess, is how each team can multiply the amount of initiative um, to increase their global reach. So they will work with us, they will work with other guys that do all different things. And by the sum of all these things, it, it, it makes it, it, make it viable. To the point that sometimes we have clubs also who ask us, hey, but does it, complete, uh, does it compete with our own product? We have our own loyalty program, we have our own socios uh, for Barca, we have our, or in Latin America with some clubs we work with, or there, there is always this question. And, and it's because they cannot reach 100% of their fan base that what we do complete and not compete what uh, their, their, their vision. So it complements them, basically. Totally, uh, yeah. Right. And so um, tell us a bit, maybe a bit more detail in terms of what different clubs have done and like what would typically be the price ranges that fans have to pay in order to participate in a competition or vote on, as you said, like the, the starting 11 or the bus design or, or things like that. So the... Um... Okay. The, uh, so first of all, you, you don't pay to vote. That's actually, you, know, you don't pay to have a say. That's one thing that is misunderstood sometimes is as soon as I own my Juventus token, I may got it for free. I earned it. I won it. I am a ticket season holder. I'm a member of a team. I got it for free. Or I bought it. To buy it, I have a couple of opportunities. Either I go on the socials app, I buy it. Or I go sometimes on crypto exchanges and I can buy it as well and then send it to the social stack. Depends how you want to do it. But as soon as I own that, I'm, I'm part of the community and I can vote. When I vote, um, so we, we had, now we have thousands of uh, use case or business case rather. Um, the one I always use because that's the one I like, it's the uh, Juventus. Uh, who, uh, for, and it was especially our first poll ever, ever. And we did like a TV ad for that and, too, and, and everything. It was cool. But uh, Juventus, they asked their fans, what music do you want to have in the stadium every time we score a goal? Because for the last eight years, it was the same music, which makes sense as well. Huh? But they, they, they asked that and we kind of forced them to ask that. I mean, forced them, pushed them. And the guys voted was the 6th of January last year. I mean, before the 6th of January. Then 6th of January last year, uh, there was a ceremony before the match. They introduced the music in the stadium. That was before COVID. That was very cool. And thank you, Ronaldo. The guy scored three uh, goals uh, in a row and then uh, ended up having 4-0. So for the, during the whole match, 4-0, the music was heard big time. And actually, same again the week after, 3-0, 4-0. So it was very cool. And as a fun fact, uh, Konami, Pro Evolution Soccer, uh, they had to buy the right of the music to put that music in the in the game as well to make sure that they fit the reality. And they were pissed at us because it cost them whatever it cost them. Um, so it can be anything. It can be the design of the jersey. It can be the design of the facade of the stadium. Paris Saint Germain is doing that. It can be um, a memo. It can be a, a lucky charm in the captain arm band thingy. The, the, the more creative clubs will be, the more valuable it will become not as a price but at was at, at as what you own and one cool thing and that's my and that's our job is how we're gonna make the clubs competing against each other because at the end i want psg to be super innovative but then i want barca and, and juventus to be pissed at it so they are even more innovative because the more they compete the more they're gonna offer to the fans and the more they offer to the fans the, the more that become valuable again not as a price but as a utility and as a product so it's all about education. It's all about breaking barriers. It's all about time. At the end, I could have $200 million today. I could not do faster what we are doing. It's all about education, education, education. So you mentioned um, that you have 25 or so partners right now. Um, how do you see like the next five or 10 years in terms of those, those timelines with the education part with it, with the uh, investment? Uh, what, five or 10 years, man. That's a very long journey. Uh, well, what kind of strategy do you usually work with? Uh, well, next week is already like next week, one month and a half is already like a very, very long term for me. Um, I mean, in short term, our focus are the, are the following. First is having a better product. Uh, even our platform struggled last week. Uh, was it last week? Uh, 10 days ago, sorry. We, we launched a token and we had so much requests, which is a good problem to have. <laughs> Don't take me wrong. But we had too much requests at the same time that even though our platform was super scaled, etc., it didn't handle it. So now we fixed it uh, because we learned. And again, it's about time. The, the, the amount of traffic we got at that time is because there was so much demand 
but we could not we could not really replicate that alone. We we could, but we didn't. So no, no, we learned a lot. Um, so priority for us are product. How to make a product that is more engaging? We're launching we're launching all the gamification part in, in a few weeks now. Uh, we are launching um, more teams, more sports. Um, our, our goal is that by this summer we'll have like something that really look great. It's not perfect by far. But it's there. People understand when you enter into the app and the product, you will understand more or less what we are doing. And at the end, it's more and more utility. With uh, with um, you know, COVID was um, COVID could have been a black swan event for us in a way that it could have killed us uh, because it could have created the fact that hey, first of all, the crypto market collapsed and it did. <laughs> it was very scary at some point, um, but it. The, the, the clubs suddenly there is no match at, uh, for a while, and especially in France, there was no match anymore. You cannot send the people, you know, in the, in the contract we have, we have, I think, 3,500 uh, tickets uh, per season with all the clubs, and we send zero the last 12 months. So uh, it's not about what it costs, it's not the fact that it's frustrating that we cannot send people to the, to the, um, to the, the, to the things. And we have VIP box, like in every club, we were, almost every club we were working with. So. COVID was a, has been an issue, but COVID triggered our success uh, because it gave us the time to build what we were doing. And most importantly, it forced the club to think out of the box about, hey, we don't have people anymore in our stadium. Let's not, let's not forget about the fact that our fans that are usually never in our stadium are not the same that are not in the stadium but that have, will have come as well. So this 1% or 0.1% of fans no, or like the 99% others. So now we need to think, how can we talk to them? How can we monetize them, engage them? And, and of course, clubs needed revenue. And we came with a product at the right time in the right place. Uh, and that became very successful. Great. You, you mentioned that you're also obviously um, already in other sports and, and you're gonna include more sports in, in the future. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about the differences between how it go, how it works with other sports versus football. Like, are, are there any major differences? Are there any lessons that you can apply from one uh, sport to the other, or are they unique because their fans are? Unique? Oh no, the, I, I will not put the fans in the in the mix. Um, for for one, one of our community members in um, in our channels one day said something that I'm I'm, I'm using again is. Each team is big for their fans. Uh, so th there is no such a small team. For me, if I'm a fan of a small team, it doesn't matter. For, they are big for me. For my, in my own eyes, they are big. So the, the fans, I'm not saying the fans are all the same, but their relationship, their passion, that, uh, that, that are more or less the, the same, except in a few countries where football is so much part of the society, like Turkey, like Brazil, uh, or like Latin America in general, uh, where it's really... Uh, fusional. It's it's a fusion between the people and the, and, and the game itself, uh, as a as a whole society. Um, in terms of the difference between football and other club and other sports, and I will put US aside um, for obvious reason, but football is by far away the most organized organization, probably because there is the most money as well. Um, the, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the difficulty, the difficulty is that there is not enough money. Actually, the difficulty is there is not enough money in middle and the middle of the ladder and the, and the bottom of the ladder. So you have clubs in, uh, in football or in other uh, sports that don't have enough digital people because they cannot afford to have people who will take care of their social media or anything. So they cannot really prepare for the future. They cannot really, you know, they know how to sell tickets. They know how to sell merchandising. They know how to sell the rights, but it's not them doing it. It's the, it's the league anyway. Uh, they sell a bit sponsoring. Okay, great. But that's it. So for, for, for the, the play here is how we help as well. I'm not going to say second tier. It's not, it's not accurate, but um, not, the, not only just the big guys to generate revenue uh, because they are not equipped uh, to do that. And that's, yeah, that's the play. You posted recently that in 2021 there will be a new job created, which is <laughs> assets. 
and that if uh, a club's current head of digital doesn't have a crypto strategy, that they should fire him or her. <laughs> Can you elaborate on that? I'm a bit, yeah, I, I'm very vocal, of course, on social media and LinkedIn or whatever, mainly because again, the goal is to is to move the lines. It's it's to push it's to push people out of their comfort zone. So, yes, if your club <laughs> doesn't have a digital asset. Fine tokens, crypto, uh, NFTs, collectibles, whatever you want to call it, a strategy. I do believe you should fire your head of uh, your head of digital, but that's only if you have a head of digital, which is not a, it's not necessarily always all the clubs. The, the top tier, of course, they do, but it's not always the case of the smaller ones. Um, now, the um, uh, I, I believe, and, and I'm biased because, of course. Right now, we are very happy. We are very successful. It will not last. Let's let's be realistic. You know, we can fail tomorrow morning in every single way. Um, but we are still building up. Momentum is growing. Uh, so what we do and what the crypto space and digital asset does will stay, period. The same way that Bitcoin, you, you, you can be against Bitcoin, but it's there and it's happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was with uh, the, the CEO of a massive uh, private equity fund, uh, last week and the guy was like well i don't understand bitcoin but it's here it's there it's not gonna it's, it's not gonna go anywhere now. Uh, and it's a little bit the same with what we do fan tokens now uh, or uh, today uh, t- 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 uh, 380 well it's actually a 400 million dollar uh, market cap so that's the sum of all the fan tokens that are in circulating supply um and, and that's a lot of money uh, that's a massive amount of money. And then the goal that it will be more because we're going to add more and more IPs and more and more uh, op- uh, partners into the ecosystem. So this will not disappear. This may evolve. The utility may evolve. The way we promote it, the way we engage with it, the way we, we do it, regulatory-wise, product-wise, there, there is a hundred reasons that it will evolve. But it's here, it's there, it's happening. So the question is, so, uh, the mo- most of the clubs most, not all, but most of the clubs don't want to be first, but they definitely don't want to be last. Yeah. You mentioned in the beginning that um, for the clubs, you know, a lot of it is obviously about money because they have to pay the players and, and, and be able to win titles. Um, last year, if I'm correct, you generated $30 million for your partners. This year, your target is $150 million. Where do you see that eventually? And, and maybe how much per club is, is a realistic target to have uh, in terms of monetizing? It, it, it definitely depends on each club. Um, I, I cannot name them necessarily, but we have clubs right now. We have clubs that generated more than $20 million and we have more than one. Two zero, two zero. Yeah, well, I hit six months actually. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, six months. Uh, and and that's why I, I mean, uh, this weekend, as you may have seen on my LinkedIn yesterday or two days ago, I increased our actually the the um, our, our forecast in terms of revenue because originally we wanted to do like sixty million, but we already we are we are on the twelfth of April. We already made generated more than sixty million. So um, so this revenue. So then this revenue is you. Let's make it like a, a general rule. This revenue is split 50-50 with the clubs. So it means that this year we expect to give more or less. 75 million dollars to the clubs, clubs and IP in general all over the world. Uh, and whoever we work with, that's a lot of money. All right, great. Um, then you also talked about education before. Um, and obviously yeah, in this whole crypto space, there's a lot of hype, there's scams, there's misinformation. How do you, how do you deal with that? Or maybe what kind of recommendations do you typically give to people that are dipping their toes in this space for the first time? Uh, well, always do not FOMO, do not fear of missing out. Um, that's number one. I hate hype. I mean, which is bad to say because we, we live thanks to hype as well sometimes. And in, in Chile's and socials, we, we had in, in March, we had a massive hype, sorry, a spike, which was generated by the hype, hype of the ecosystem. Then the key is to make it sustainable and not just drying up. Um, you, 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 if you look at the numbers, for example, of NBA Top Shop, which is the, like the super hot girls that everybody wants to be with, uh, the reality is, and, and it's not me judging whatsoever, it's just that the reality is the, 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 um, the, um, the volume completely dried up the last few days and a few weeks now. So 
we have to be careful that, and I've seen that for 25 years in, in, in the internet space, in, in 2000, 2008, et cetera. You have usually cycles of super hype and super hyper growth of stuff, but the question is how sustainable this become. For me, in terms of uh, NFTs and collectible, I see a lot of projects that have a long-term vision, 100%. Um, but I do believe there is a lot of things that's gonna die um, and a lot of garbage, a lot of noise. Um, and the key is to find the things that's gonna last. And that's the challenge for all of us. Huh? Nobody knows what's gonna last. I, I think what I'm doing is gonna last, but who knows? Yeah. Um, and it's back to your point about education. People who, who, who jump in in the crypto space, it's all about reading online. Don't believe influencers. Don't believe people that are paid to tell you that it's amazing. Um, just spend time. Spend time reading, trying the product if there is a product, um, and a little bit of common sense as well. Uh, you know, uh, if if you think it cannot work and the other think it cannot work, maybe it's not going to work. So just don't don't always go against the current um, as well. But on the other end, if you don't take any risk, there is no reward. So hey, good luck, guys. <laughs> And so just elaborating a little bit more on NFTs, that's obviously been the, the most recent hype uh, in many ways. And obviously, you know, sports, football specifically, they are well known for, you know, collectibles fans. Obviously, they, they like to accumulate a stuff that has their club's logo on it. What yep. do you see that evolving towards specifically for, for football? Um, or are you still the, trying to figure it out? A bit of both, I guess. Uh, we, we actually issued our NFT strategy in February 2020. It's public. If you Google it, uh, I did in the end of, January, end of January 2020 or early 2020, February, sorry. Uh, I did a video and I explained what we are going to launch in NFTs. And F me, I didn't launch in time what we wanted to do. So uh, no, I'm, I'm annoyed because people will say, oh, look, <laughs> they are doing, uh, they are following up the others. So, no, no, guys, go on YouTube. You will find the video where I say what we're going to do. Um, but I, I guess th there is a big difference between Americans and, and European. And you know, in US, there is this culture of trading cards uh, because of baseball and all that stuff. In Europe, we have the culture of Panini. Panini is for kids, it's not for adults. There is no adults that uh, trade uh, Panini cards, it doesn't exist. Or marginal, it's not a business per se. Um, so the culture of, of relationship of collectibles and tradable collectibles between Europe and US is slightly different. Um, so the question is what can you, especially if you think Europe, what can you create in the soccer slash football space that is scalable and will work? Um, and I don't have the answer to that. I have a pretty clear answer of what we are going to launch and how we believe it's going to be valuable. And it's related of, uh, actually by, um, uh, it's related to the fact that you own fan tokens. So you will own, you will need to own uh, your Juventus token to actually get rewarded in NFTs of Juventus, is it moments, is it something this will be disclosed? But there is a, a, cost, a cost consequences, let's say, between uh, fan tokens and NFTs for us. Um, we, we're not gonna jump. First, we don't want to compete with Dapper Labs and be a We don't want to compete with our friends of Sorer uh, that are doing like a fantasy game and then they're gonna do something else. So our, our key is to make sure that we, 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 we like to be, you know, this, uh, we, we call that the red ocean, red ocean and blue ocean. Uh, we, we want to be in a blue ocean. We don't want to go where there is plenty of people fighting for the same market. We want to create our own market. So we created our fan tokens market. We are the only company doing that uh, today and doing it successfully. Uh, and NFTs, at the end, NFTs is a tech. So the question is how you use the tech, uh, what the content you put in the tech, how do you market it, how you distribute it, what is the business model of it? Uh, the, the, all the FOMO and the, the hype around NFT, 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 it, it annoys me so much. And, and, and I made it very clear in conversation I have with uh, clubs and stuff that because I, I talk to leagues and clubs, oh, we're going to have our NFT uh, strategy. We're going to do this, 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 and this. Oh, come on. Uh, and, and again, it's not going to work anyway because what they do is probably not going to work. And that's my gut feeling. But time will tell. Time will tell, definitely. So, um, so what's next? Uh, you said, uh, obviously, you're working on product. You want to add more partners, but also add new features to the platform. You're opening up new offices in, in Madrid, in the US. Like, what are your expectations maybe for, for the US market, if you want to elaborate on, on that? 
Uh, US is a different animal because everything goes through the leagues. Uh, we, we have, um, we, we made a clear announcement that we are keen to invest at least, <laughs> it's clearly going to be at least, $50 million uh, into the US market. Um, and we, I, I will not disclose too much because of uh, uh, commercial and uh, confidentiality stuff, but we are in a good shape uh, for the US market. Uh, we are believers that our product fit the local market. Um, there is a need and an appetite from teams and leagues. Um, and we are the best partner for them to do this. Um, so it will take time. So I think it's still going to take a lot of time. There is a lot of education because everywhere in Europe, if you talk about socios or Chile, somehow the guys, they heard it. You know, if you're in a soccer space or a football space, you've seen it, you heard about it, you read something. In US, Americans don't, uh, don't care about uh, football. They don't care about soccer. So, ah, cool, uh, see Barcelona and Juventus and PSG work with you. Cool story, bro, who cares? Uh, so there is more education to be done in US uh, because there is, they, they, they live in a bubble. Uh, yeah, so we have to educate them more. But luckily for us, they are calling all our partners and their partners say, oh yes, we generated more than $10 million with them, oh, whatever. So it helps. If I want, if I'm a, if I'm representing a club and I want to become a partner, what what are the steps? If if you want to share, uh, like you know, from those initial meetings to the fan token offering to actually using the platform, like what are the dynamics typically of, of becoming a partner of Socios? Um, well, it's pretty easy. It's uh, I mean, it's making a deal with us with our partnership team. We have like five five six people more full time that are dedicated on the partnership team to onboard teams. We, we don't sign everybody. We, we could sign more, but we just sometimes we, we, we need to focus a little bit because our bandwidth is limited. Um, we, we are focusing on teams and IPs that we believe bring value to the ecosystem. Um, eventually, we want to have hundreds, uh, but just need time. Uh, and the process is, uh, okay, we sign an agreement. We agree. There is a revenue share, as I said. Sorry. Uh, then we'll take probably a month and a half to launch. Uh, not technically, technically I can launch anything tomorrow morning, but just to educate, work with the team, PR, marketing. We have a, a, a good um, IP um, that we sign and we are 12th of April. Yeah, we will launch in two months, more or less. We could launch it in one week, but we're going to launch it in two months because we want to create uh, appetite. We want people hungry for that brand um, and, and creating content as well. And then once it's launched, the reality is the launch is the easiest part because once it's launched, the key is how do you sustain it? How do you create more and more uh, value and utility? How do you create more polls, more survey, more benefits for the token holders? How can I get discount? How I create? We're going to discuss that soon. So let, let me break a scoop here. But we, we, we are creating some like um, events in some very famous stadium uh, because COVID restrictions are getting easier in some countries. So we, we're going to have events where only fan token holders are going to be able to play against each other on this famous stadium. And that's cool. Uh, and, um, and that costs a lot of money because it's like 44, 44 people plus uh, media, TV and stuff. So it's, it's a very big exp operation. But my, my point here is uh, it's to find the ideas that we can scale uh, and that takes time. But it's more or less one month, two months uh, in the meantime. All right, great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then just maybe to, to wrap up uh, before we move to our private Q&A session with the FBA candidates and alumni, uh, anything, uh, any closing remarks you wanted to, to share with the audience, whether it could be potential clubs or potential fan uh, token holders? Uh, potential clubs, you know, guys, where to find us? You can go on LinkedIn uh, to find me or to find Magnus, um, number one. Uh, and he has a lot of uh, resources of people that works in the industry or either at some point intern of people that will, will look for a job. We are hiring. We're going to hire a lot in Madrid, especially um, because that's going to be our second HQ. Um, so please uh, connect with us. We are hiring people that wants to join our uh, offices in Madrid. Um, and yeah, and most importantly, download the socials.com app now uh, and uh, buy tokens of teams that you want to be part of. And just for you to know, Chris, I have six minutes before I need to jump in the other call. All right, great. Thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Alex, for sharing so many uh, exciting thoughts. And uh, we'll be soon uh, back to you with a new webinar. Take care.